Hello, everybody. It's John Schneider, your host for the special edition of Jersey Bay Shark Country. It's the Christmas edition, so Merry Christmas. And I'm here in Highlands, New Jersey at the New Life Christian Church. And with me is Pastor Marty McGrail. Marty, Merry Christmas. God bless you. Merry Christmas to you. Thank you very, very much. Um, Tell us about the Christmas season. What does it mean to you? It means hope for so many people. And, you know, we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. And for us Christians, there is, I mean, every day is Christmas, but there's no greater time and an opportunity to tell people all over the world that God loves them so much. Yeah. And that's why he came to earth to be with us. And, and you know, it, it, it's interesting to me that uh, I grew up in a, a family that wasn't too religious, uh, and yet we always knew that there was a spiritual aspect to it. And every year uh, we celebrate this important date and the birth of Christ really did change the world, didn't it? How, how did it change the world? How are we different before Christ versus after Christ? Well, we have hope now, and that's the most important thing, and that people can experience the love of God in such a personal way. They, they don't have to just read about it or hear about it through a prophet. They can experience it for themselves. And when the Holy Spirit, when the Spirit of God has his hand on you, and you can turn to the left and you can turn to the right. And no matter what's going on in the world, you know, you're just not comfortable anymore in that skin. You know that there's something more, something greater. And you may not know what it is or, as we say, who he is. But you know that something's happening in you and that search begins. And uh, it's an exciting time uh, when people come to know that Jesus, is, you know, he's alive and that he loves us. And uh, it changes lives. It takes people who are addicts. It changes their lives. It delivers people from sickness, from depression, from no hope. And especially during this season, it's a time that in a way it breaks my heart because there are so many people that are alone in the world, so many people who have been hurt by the church. There are so many people who have been scorned, who have never been raised uh, uh, in faith. And some people who were raised in faith and yet they were so turned off by quote unquote religion and all of those things that go with it. And they've never known that it's a personal relationship. Jesus came, God came to this earth as Jesus, as a baby that we see the little manger and the little Christ. He came to us personally and individually. And that's how he wants to come to us even now. And there's such a great opportunity. I am very excited because I see the opportunity that God gives so many of us. We see so much negative stuff in the world today. But I want to tell you there's also some good news. It's not all just bad news that we see on, on the cable networks and everything. And the good news is that I see people every day whose lives are changed, who are given hope, who had no hope before, who were suicidal people who were about to give up or they went through a terrible divorce or a bad relationship or maybe they lost their baby or, or they did something wrong or they're in prison. I see lives. It's, I can't even explain it to you because there ha it has to be the power of God because people's lives like mine that are changed in such powerful ways that only could there be a supreme being that could do something like that. Well, tell us about your faith. Did it evolve? Was there a lightning strike? How did you, how did you become a faithful man, a man of Jesus? How did that happen? You know, I was raised in the church. My dad was a trustee in the church for over 60 years. My grandfather was a trustee in the church. My great grandmother was one of the founders of a church down the street here. And yet, being raised in the church as an altar boy and going through all of the rituals and everything, I never knew Jesus Christ personally. And uh, after coming back mm. from, from Vietnam and doing two tours in Vietnam, and I came back home and some things evolved in my life, and, and I got to a point of depression. I never took drugs or, or drank uh, per se, but I was going to commit suicide. My daughter is now 45 years old. She was seven years old, Ugh. and I had a gun. And it was behind my back, and I was going to commit suicide. And it was during the Christmas season. I was very lonely. I had lost her mother. And she opened the door, and I put the gun behind my back. And she said to me, Daddy, do you know that Jesus loves you? Mm. It's emotional for me because yeah. if it would have been you or a pastor or a priest, I may have shot you. But a child doesn't lie. And she came up to me, and she put her arms around me. 
And you know, I said, Lisa, where did you learn this? Where, where did you hear this? And I was crying like a baby. And she said to me, the sisters told it to me, Daddy. Mm-hmm. They said that he loves you so much. And I knew right then and there, the, it's like the Holy Spirit came upon me and told me, how could you leave this child alone? This child is innocent. How could you be so self-centered? And how could you be so selfish? And I knew right then and there that if there was God, I wanted him. I didn't know how to get him. And my journey began, and it took almost 20 or 30 years. How do you celebrate Christmas? What's a typical Christmas Eve and Christmas Day in your family? Well, you know, let me say first, every day is Christmas for us, every single day. And the greatest gift that we could ever be given, especially at Christmas, is that we know that uh, the Bible says in John 3, 16, for God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son. What gift is greater than, than someone, oh, I, I, could, I could cry right now. There's no greater gift than God giving us his own son for our own life so that we could have eternal life. And in the McGrail house, it's a little bit crazy. It's not what everybody might expect. So on Christmas Eve, we have a ritual that's been going on for years, and we watch The Preacher's Wife. Is it called The Preacher's Wife with Denzel Washington? Okay. And we watch this, and uh, every, you know, everybody's got to gather around. We sit down, and we watch this with uh, Whitney Houston and Denzel Washington, Uh and we say, look, isn't that just like Daddy? Isn't that just (laughs) like Daddy? And uh, so so that's our uh, Christmas Eve ritual. And then, of course, this year, Christmas falls on Sunday. So we have our Sunday worship service right here at New Life Christian Church at 11 o'clock. If anybody, you know, we'd like you to come down and join us and to be with us. But I want to tell you that... um, It's a great looking church. Beautiful. Very spiritual. It feels very comfortable. Well, you know, what makes it so beautiful here is not the architecture or or any of the ambiance. It's the people. Mm. And the people are the church here. And the first thing that you experience when you come, you know, not just here, but in, in, in churches all over, and you should feel this, is you feel loved. You don't feel you don't feel it's stuffy. You don't feel like you don't belong. And um, but I, I, to answer uh, how we do it, and then our family gets together after service, and we celebrate, and we exchange gifts, and we have meals, we pray together, and uh, we we have Italian food, and uh, we enjoy our time together. Now, uh, you prayed before we went on the air. Uh, for me and for the show and for the people that are watching the show and the people in this room with us. Uh, talk to me about the power of prayer. How do we pray and uh, does it work? <laughs> you know, prayer is communication. And I know with our children, um, I, I can't imagine what it would be like with my wife and our family if they came home at night when I come into the house, if they weren't talking to me. I think they're mad at me or I did something <laughs> wrong or especially my wife. I was, th- you know, would I forget to put the dog out or something? What did I do wrong? And it's the same thing with God. God craves for communication. He craves and, and not for fancy words. He wants us to be ourselves. He doesn't want you to speak like me or me to speak like you. He, ju- he made you exactly as you are. He approves of you. He loves you. He celebrates you. He's your biggest fan. And he wants you to just be yourself and just talk to him. And there's something so cleansing when you talk to God. There's something so cleansing. You say, you know, Lord, I've had a lousy day. Lord, I'm having a hard time believing in you. I'm having a real hard time. I can't pay the bills. I can't pay the mortgage. You know, I've got this lump and it's not going away. And, and you know what? The pastor and, uh, said that I should pray or, or I heard that I should pray on this or I should speak the word and it's not going away. And, and I've done everything that I know to do. And you know what? I'm having a hard time believing in you. And I've seen this crazy stuff that goes on in the churches. And, and I've been hurt by a pastor or an elder or a leader or somebody. Or, or my dad molested me or somebody hurt me when I was a kid. And I trusted you. Where were you? You weren't there. You weren't there on 9-11. You weren't there when this happened. Where were you? Where are you now? And he says to me, hey, if you will just come to me, trust me, even though you cannot see me, if you will trust me by faith, I will give you rest. And I encourage people, I encourage everybody that's listening to us today, just give them a shot. You have nothing to lose. Just ask them, please, Jesus, come into my heart. I'm the manger. I'm the the place where you can take a rest, you know, and I've tried it my way all of my life and it hasn't worked. The church hasn't worked for me. Nothing's worked for me. 
but I'm opening my heart and I'm asking you to come into my heart and please be my Lord and my Savior. And I, I don't know all this church stuff and I don't think I can dig it, but, but you know what? If you're real, I want you in my life. And right then and there, it's like being at the racetrack. The gates are open and you're off and running and the journey is incredible. You praise the Lord, it seems to me, perpetually. You're always praising the Lord. You're praising the Lord right now, aren't you? I am. How can we uh, come up to that level of praising the Lord? How do you praise the Lord? Well, you're at that level. You know, you're, I'm no different than anybody else. Um, and, and it's a matter of practicing. So I remember when I was a kid, my mother had only one record, a Johnny Mathis record. Uh -huh. And she would play, you know, this oh, chances are over and over. That's all she played over and over again. Well, before you know it, I started singing. I thought I was Johnny Mathis and I sounded like him. You know, I sounded like him. Chances are. Yes, yes. So, you know, so it's repetition and it's practice. And so when you get into the habit, when we get into the habit of talking to God, I'll give you an example of praise. God wants us to love, number one, to love him, to love ourselves, and to love our neighbor. That's what it's, that's the essence of, of, of his word. And so when we do something, it's, praise is not just going into a church and singing mm. Christian music. Praise is not a title or going to Bible school or going to Bible study or having a certain clothes or something like this. That's not praise. Praise is when, when you open the door for somebody Praise is when you realize, when, when you let someone take your seat, you pick up the tab for somebody's lunch. You praise God when you love one another, when you take care of one another. We're praising God sometimes when, when, when you, somebody lets you take, I love this word, the word favor. Say favor. Favor. <laughs> <laughs> I love the word favor because every time that we realize favor is from God. And so somebody gives you their parking place. Just this morning, somebody gave me the parking place. They're, they couldn't find one. And somebody said, take that place. I said, favor. So mm. you're praising God. You're saying to you be all the honor, all the praise, and all the glory. So all day long, we should get in the habit of saying, man, that bus didn't run me over right now. Praise the Lord. What about those people that slap you in the face, Pastor? What about those people that uh, disregard uh, what uh, what you're all about. Uh, do you get angry? Do you get frustrated with these people? I used to want to take my collar off and punch them out. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I told you I'm no different than you or anybody else. Mm -hmm. But I also had to go to God and talk to him and say, I want to grow. And so I went back into the scripture and I looked at the life of Jesus. And in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus comes and he's sitting with guys like us. And he says to them, you're the salt of the earth. And they're going, nah, I don't think so. I'm dating my cousin. I'm a thief. I'm a murderer. I'm... No, 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 no. That's what you're doing. But that's not who you are. You see, he knows who we are. And so when he tells us that we're the light of the world, I wanted that. So it's a matter of faith. When you say that I want what he has. And you know, at one point, as the Holy Spirit becomes more and more in you and I and everybody else, as the Holy Spirit becomes more, all of a sudden we realize we've become less. And we see that there is power. I have people who are very mean to me all the time. Mean, physically, intellectually, spiritually, financially, mean. The greatest thing that I could ever do, and I dreamt of this all my life and I do it all the time, is to bless them. Bless them. Mm -hmm. Pray for them. Bless them. Don't feel bad. Don't feel sorry. But bless them. Why? Because my reward is even greater. Jesus said, turn the other cheek. So he's, it's not so somebody could abuse you. It's so that you could rise up to a level with a great maturity and bless that person. And I have to tell you, especially after being a military man, I have found that the power of love, the love of God, is much more powerful than an atomic bomb. I hope so. You know, uh, you may not uh, want to answer this. Can I this. ask you a question? Yeah, sure. I think you can answer it. Go ahead. You said, I hope so. Do you want it to be so? Uh, yes. And, and don't forget, for me, hope is faith. So when I hope for something, you know, it's not always, you know, uh, pleasant for me to look at the world and say, okay, I accept all this. There are things that I'd like to change, that I'd like God to change, and he probably is, or she is probably is. 
Let me ask you, uh, and this wait, may, wait, wait, go, wait. okay. Wait. No, oh, no, no, no. So he's no. turning the tables. No, no, no. Get I want to ask you it. a question. Sure. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. Okay. I can be what it says I can be. All right. I can have what it says I can have. So normally when we're asking God for things, especially at Christmas, kids, you know, usually we're asking God, our dads and moms for things that's already, they already bought. It's in the closet. It's been there for six months, right? Right. And it's the same thing with God. The things that we're asking for, he's already given us. So we have to, God is saying, I've already given it to you, but you keep asking me for it. Oh, I see. Yeah. So speak yeah. it into yeah. your life. If, yeah. you want, if you want peace, if, you want, if you're not married and you, you want a mate, uh, if you need money, if you need health, start speaking to things that are not. It says in the so, book of Romans, yes. speak to things that are, write this down, speak to things that are not as though they were okay. that they might become. So if you want love, be loving. If you want peace, be peaceful. Is that right? Sowing seeds. Yes. It's called the principle of re reaping and sowing what you want. You must give. Okay. Well, this may be difficult for you to answer uh, because it's very personal. I'd like to know how intimate you have been with the Lord in terms of a moment in your life, not necessarily a miracle that God, is, uh, that God has performed, but a moment of intimacy that you've had with Him. Well, the one I've had many moments of intimacy with him. We have an intimate relationship. So my relationship with him is no different than it is with my wife or my children. It's just at a different level. So we're at a close intimacy all the time. But the most recent that I could think of, uh, or the most dramatic that might minister, was when this church was destroyed by Hurricane Sandy and under 10 feet of water. You know, as I mentioned to you, I was in Vietnam as a young, as a young boy. And so I was one of the first responders here in Highland. So I had been out there for 22 days, and I was afraid to come near our own place because mm -hmm. I knew what I was going to see. When I came through the door, there was muck and the pews and everything. It looked like someone threw more than one grenade in this place. It was devastating to me, uh, spiritually, physically, and psychologically. I'm almost 70 years old. And when I came through that door, I knew that my life was over. We had no more members. I had no, not any money. I didn't even have a message. I had nothing left. And my wife and I came through the door. I was here alone several hours before she came to find me. And right out there, I fell on my knees in this muck and I cried harder than I have ever cried. I didn't cry like that when I had cancer. I cried harder than I have ever cried even as a child. And, and I cried out to God, and these are the exact words. I'll quote exactly what I said right in the middle of that room. I was covered in muck. It was freezing. I was wet. And I said to him, what am I going to do with my life? I can't go get a job. I'm already old. Where will I go? What will I do? This is your church. This is not my church. If you want this church to be here, you have to build it. You have to take control of my life. You have to bring the people. I can't anymore. I'm tired. I'm burnt out. I'm exhausted. You have to bring the money. I don't have any more money to give. And you know, Father, I don't even have a message anymore. I don't even know what to say to the people anymore. I cried and cried and cried. About two weeks later, I received a call from a friend of mine that I hadn't seen in a very long time who has a church of about 35,000 people in Atlanta, Georgia. He called me and he said, Pastor McGrail, I heard you guys are having some trouble up there. I said, oh God, what is this, a joke? And he says, what's your address? Mm. That pastor sent me a check that was incredible. I didn't even really know or expect anything like that. And several weeks later, talk about an, a, an Oprah aha moment. <laughs> A pastor from Maryland came up here with an 18-wheeler with 50 people and came to the middle of our town. There was no electricity or anything. And we unloaded food and clothes and different things for people. I did not know he was the pastor. And he had on a Baltimore Orioles jacket. And he looked at me and he said, Pastor McGrail, he said, the Holy Ghost told me to find favor with you, sir. Hmm. And I'm saying, okay. And 
So I walked out of the thing and he says to me, would you please pray with the people here? I took their hands right in the middle of the street and I prayed with about 50 people. I said to a woman, an old woman, who is that guy? She said, why, he's our pastor. That's Pastor, that's pastor McClendon. And I says, oh, what? So several days later, I received a call and a first class accommodations for my wife and I to go to National Harbor, Maryland mm. to preach in a little teeny church. But what that pastor didn't tell me is that he took a mall like Mammoth Mall and converted it into a cathedral. Wow. There were 5,000 people wow. in that church. Oh my gosh. When I went into the church, I said to him, I thought you said this was a small church. He says, well, it is, Pastor, compared to the other ones around here. <laughs> he asked the people that day to reach into their pocket after I preached, and I can't share with you how much. But he asked each one of them to reach into their pocket and write a certain amount on a check. Those people lined up for hours to bless my wife, Jessica, and myself and our church. And we came back here with an incredible blessing to rebuild the church. I had nothing to do with that. Mm -hmm. That was a direct result of the conversation of, that I had with God on the floor of this place. You see, I needed to become less and he needed to become more. And people don't realize something, especially this Christmas. A lot of good came out of Hurricane Sandy. We saw people that would never even talk to their neighbors, giving them food and clothes and shelter and, and money and different things. And, and so Christmas for me is not December 25th. It's all year round. And, and if I could, if you don't mind, it's just I have a, a burden on my heart about this Christmas, as I mentioned to you. Can I talk to them for a moment? Yes, please do. You know, my heart breaks. When I think of my mother who's alone, she loved my father so much. And I see so many different people whose hearts are breaking. I know there's a great excitement, especially with our kids. And, and they say, I need this and I want that. And, you know, we go and we, we, many of us charge things and spend money we don't even have. And we've got to give our favorite people gifts and different things. But, but I want to talk to those of you who can't do that. I want to speak to those of you who are lonely and your hearts are breaking. I want to speak to those of you who may be sick or those of you who have lost a loved one. And you say, Marty, I, I don't feel Christmas. I don't even want Christmas. I, I can't wait until it's over, let alone start. Can I tell you how God helped me? Reach out to someone. Reach out of yourself. You be the gift giver. Oh, even if you don't know anybody at all. You be the gift giver. Maybe you don't have any money to give them, but give them an encouraging word. Give them one of your cupcakes. Give them a loaf of bread. Give them a cup of coffee. Give them love. And I'll tell you something. When Christmas is all over, you will experience a brand new year, a brand <laughs> new life, because you'll realize it's Christmas all the time. And I speak that over you right now. I'm really speaking out there and calling out to people whose hearts are breaking that are suffering from depression right now and loneliness. And I'm begging you in the name of Jesus. You see, we're, we're his hands. We're his hands to the world. He came into this world, God himself, to show us how to do it, to show us how to be his hands, to be his expression of love to the world. And that's all I'm asking you to do this Christmas season and it doesn't matter who you are or what you are or who people say you are. Reach out to someone and bless them because more than anything else this Christmas, our country and our world needs love and we need hope. And I believe with all of my heart, I believe and I stand on it that if each one of us will just reach one with the love of God, not religion, the Bible says that God is love not religion. Jesus didn't even like religious guys. He didn't like them. He wanted that personal relationship. Imagine, he says to Mary, you know, the angel Gabriel comes to Mary. She's minding her business, this little girl. Mm. She's a virgin. Talk about Christmas. It's a wonderful, wonderful story in history. And the angel comes and calls her favored lady. That's you and me. You see, when God comes into your heart, when you feel that touch of God, you've got to start realizing, oh my gosh, it's God, I'm favored. Something great is going to happen. You've got to start speaking what you want. 
And she said, how can I become pregnant? How can I carry this child that is having this conversation? No one's ever touched me. No one's ever touched me. And he said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And at that point, she said, let thy will be done unto me. And as soon as she said that, mm. let thy will, let your will be done unto me. That's the moment she conceived Jesus. That's powerful. And it that's is. what I'm asking you and our audience. And that's what I had to do when you ask me about my own faith. I had to say, Jesus, come into my heart this Christmas. I was suicidal, friends. Come into my heart and be my Lord and my Savior. I never dreamt in a million years. I, I was a successful businessman. I never dreamt in a million years. Thank me, you. of all people, that I'd be here preaching the gospel <laughs> of Jesus Christ and asking people at Christmas and throughout the year to open your heart and give Jesus a chance. Thank you, Pastor. I appreciate it. Uh, no matter what religion you are, uh, I hope that you will celebrate Christmas with peace and love in your heart and that as you enter the new year again, I have many friends of all faiths. I wish you the most peaceful and loving of Christmases would you share with us a, a, a small prayer for our, our listeners, our viewers, and for the people in the Bayshore country? I'd be honored, and thank you. Can we pray, Father, in the name of Jesus? I lift up our viewers today. I lift up my friend John. I, I thank you, Lord God, that he gave me an opportunity to sit with him today. And I speak every one of your blessings and every one of your promises over the viewing audience today. I would pray that they would open their hearts and receive Jesus. I would pray that they would open their hearts and receive the greatest Christmas that they have ever experienced before, the gift of peace, the gift of eternal life, and the gift of hope. And I thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray over my friends. Amen. Amen. And I would ask you and, and our viewing audience, the greatest gift that you could ever give me is if you would please remember me in your prayers. And if you're not a believer, I'd be so grateful if you just wish me well. Well, uh, that is our show. I hope you enjoyed it. It's our Christmas show, 2016. Maybe next year we'll do it again. Thank you for watching. And remember what I always say. If you see me out there with a camera, running around, flying a drone, driving a car, riding a bicycle, please do stop me and say hello. Because nothing... Nothing is more important than meeting you. So long, folks.